All right, everyone, welcome to Quick Fix Fantasy. This is the first episode. My name is Chris P, and I am joined by the expert himself, Dr. Doug Levy. What's up, Doug? Welcome back. Oh, welcome uh, for the first time. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know we got we got to do a little bit beforehand with the original Quick Fix podcast episode. But yeah, this is the first time we're going to be diving in exclusively on fantasy. I'm definitely excited. Um, I've mentioned it on social media a little, but like I'm not I'm pretty new to Call of Duty fantasy in general. Obviously, having worked with the team for the last three years, I'm not interested not playing any fantasy um but i've been a big fantasy player a big dfs guy for a really long time 10 10 plus years probably and so yeah i'm excited to go on this journey with everybody and like try to try to make us some money be smarter betters absolutely so it's like a brand new thing you know where i've seen it pop up more and more of course daily fantasy is a massive thing within itself with traditional sports but more than ever, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, analysts out there and people that, you know, crunch all data and everything like that. Anything that, you know, anyone could try to find more information or more of an edge, you know, on these, you know, da uh, daily fantasy apps. Uh, it's definitely come to the light a lot more. So I'm super excited to, you know, learn from you and just, you know, be here for the ride. But as you know, as someone who is not too familiar with, you know, the layout, we'll start with DraftKings, you know, the layout of, you know, how we're building lineups or how people are building lineups within DraftKings. I know that there's like a captain spot, a couple flex spots. Can you dive a little uh, deeper into, you know, what really plays into the breakdown on this app? Yeah. So we can, I'll start with, yeah, what you mentioned here about DraftKings. And then I do think like, um, it's a important to note like you you mentioned the other the other big player is like uh what we'd call like pickums contest which is like what prize picks and underdog do um and like I'll, I'll try to contrast it a little bit to what they what prize picks but we'll, we'll we'll say prize picks but we mean prize picks underdog any site i don't know in other states what's available but so on DraftKings specifically um draft you get a set amount of salary players uh, are all different prices based on their past performance. And then you draft a team, which consists of one captain and five players, which can be of any position. Um, they're just all called flex slots. And then you draft one team. The teams are typically lower cost, uh, and they also don't score as many points. They only get points for things like rounds one or games one, where players get points for kills. They lose points for deaths. They get points for hill time. Um, I think there's some other like minor things you get points for but those are the big ones you get twice you get two points for a kill lose a point for a death so uh, on average getting more kills is usually better because you're disproportionately rewarded for the kills relative to the deaths and then hill time is a nice uh, nice bonus for players that might not be huge uh like killing players but they get a lot of hill time soak a lot of time um and then you also the other big uh dynamic in DraftKings cod is that you get bonus points when your team doesn't play a map so they're called like do not play bonuses so like if we a uh, team three o's uh you get a bonus for not playing the fourth map and a bonus for not playing the fifth map both teams get that bonus though not just the team that won the team that wins in a 3-0 gets an additional bonus but both teams will get a bonus for not playing maps um, so that can be useful for both teams if you have a, a quick 3-0 a, a player that's on the team that loses might get some additional points that might help them make more value so i think we talk about value a lot on DraftKings because you have to you have fifty thousand dollars to buy your players for your lineup you have to use that money as efficiently as possible so i mean that's basically what DraftKings is is draft a lineup try to score the most points possible um the payout on DraftKings for like a traditional tournament is that like you have a few hundred people enter first place you get um, I say like, so the $10 contest for tomorrow pays out 20 times to first place. So if you enter $10, you win 2000 or, uh, what is it? A thousand dollars to uh, plays pays out 20 X. I don't remember what it is, but, uh, <laughs> the, the, and then it's 16 X for the $3 tournament. So you get a lot more money, um, for, for winning those tournaments, but there's a lot more people entering those. So you can contrast that with prize picks. Uh, prize picks is it's just you against prize picks. So you play, um, you can pick any number of different player props. So the player props are how many kills a player gets in the first, second, third map, or the sum of the first three maps. So you'll see something like a BZ over under six and a half kills in map two. So will a BZ get more or less than <laughs> six and a half kills in the search and destroy obviously can't get six and a half but will you get seven or more or six or less um, you can bet on either side of that 
And so, and you can also only bet, you can't bet single players. You have to bet multiple in the same, what would you say, in the same slip. Um, you need to bet at least two. Uh, and there's different multipliers for how many you get right. Uh, you, prize picks would hope that those lines are set so that 50% come on either side over and under that the six and a half that Abizi gets seven and seven or more kills in that search 50% of the time and you get six or less the other 50%. That'd be ideal for prize picks because they don't pay you out. So like if let's say you could only bet on one person, just bet on Abizi to get over six and a half for it to be fair. And if it were 50%, you should get two X payout for that, but you don't get quite two X. You get 1.95 X payout. So price picks is hoping that what they set those lines, they're hoping that it's 50% that he will go over or under on that. Um, I think yeah, I'm sort of rambling a bit about the differences here, but I would make one other note. I think the big difference between prize picks and DraftKings is that on DraftKings, the the people that you make the money from are other players. DraftKings just takes 10 to 15% of the entry fees. So everyone pays $10 to enter. DraftKings takes 10% of that. They don't care who wins. If every single one of you entered the exact same lineup and you all tie for first, you just split the 90% that's left over. So if you enter $10 and everyone played the same lineup, you'd just be out your 10% of the big pot. Um, you basically get $9 back. If, if everyone entered a $10 lineup, DraftKings says, okay, who cares? Here's our 10%. On prize picks, it's not like that. On prize picks, you're competing against prize picks. Prize picks sets the lines. If every single person bets over a BZ six and a half kills and a BZ does get nine kills in the search, prize picks pays out of their pocket to you for the fact that you bet that. Why prize picks wants it to be 50 50 is because they're hoping that to pay you for that they can take the people who bet the under on a BZ under six and a half and take that money to help pay. But in the end, they're the one taking the money and paying you. You're not playing against other people per se. Um, that's the big difference. I think it can be a little confusing because like the payout structures, especially when you're getting like multiple legs in the same, like what we'd say like a parlay, you're, you're betting a lot of different things and you're getting like a 20 X payout. It can sort of feel like DraftKings, where like you come in first, you get 20 X your, your, your money entered or whatever. But the difference is, you're competing against prize picks. You're not competing against other people. On DraftKings, all you have to do is be smarter than the next guy in the room. On prize picks, you have to be smarter than everyone because everyone's informing prize picks and prize picks doesn't want to pay you. So for like the traditional sports buffs, DraftKings is like entering a fantasy football league with your buddies. You all throw in $100 and you spread the money throughout depending on if you come first, the second place gets their money back, what have you. And like prize picks would be for the traditional betters building a player prop parlay is, is yes. that accurate okay yeah it's a, yeah the, the allure of DraftKings and like the reason that it's become popular is it's yeah it's basically season-long fantasy football except on the one day scale mm -hmm. you pick a team and you yeah it, you see how many points those players score and then you can pick a new team the next day it's a little different than like traditional like snake draft fantasy where like nobody else can have the same players as you everybody can pick the same players if you wanted like in my example everyone theoretically could pick the exact same lineup for a day it doesn't happen but um that is the one little difference but yeah in general it's just it just turns the season into a single day but yeah if you're familiar with parlays and regular sports betting pickums are basically the same thing um you're picking multiple outcomes that in most cases aren't correlated with each other um and then you are you're only getting paid if all of them occur. So like, let's say in the most simple prize picks example, you can pick two players on prize picks. So on prize picks, if you get picked two, you get paid three, I believe you get paid three X back. Um, yeah, you get paid three X back. So like, yeah, if I enter $20 on a two, a two leg prize picks uh, slip, I'll get paid $60 back if I win. So my 20 that I had originally put in plus 40 more. But like, if we wanted this game to be fair, I should be getting, if I wanted to go on forever playing this game, except instead of with players, it was with coin flips, let's say. You had to pick, I only get paid out if both the coins come up heads. We flip two coins, they both come up heads. If I want to keep playing that game forever, I'd get, I'd need to get paid out 4x my entry fee for it to be worth my time, or not to be worth my time, but to not go bust after a little bit of time. Because there's, yeah, you have a 50% chance on the first, 50% chance on the second, 25% chance to get both and you need to get pay it out one over that to continue to play. So you see that you only get paid out 3x, so you need to be doing better than coin flips. If your guys are getting, if you're winning on there 50% of the time, that's not going to be good enough. You're going to need 
I think on a two, on a two play, you need to be about fifty eight percent of the time each of your picks playing uh, to win. It's very interesting. It's a whole different world, especially for me. Uh, but you know, I'm very very excited. Like I said at the beginning, to learn from you, and I know that you've done a ton of numbers going into this. Uh, you know, talking about the upcoming week uh, weekend that we have with uh, the Call of Duty League. We are going into Major 5 qualifiers. Uh, a lot of teams fighting for champs. You know, a lot of good matchups coming on. Some lopsided, one, some, some pretty even. Um, but uh, how do you feel about diving into them? You ready for that? or? Yeah, no, we can definitely, let's get into these games. Um, I will say just like, for people listening like this is we're recording this on thursday so we have a little bit more content to talk about for the friday games because one DraftKings has already posted their slate um so we can use that as an example um for illustrative purposes we can talk about the the slate that DraftKings has already posted the salaries for those players and then also on sites like prize picks and underdog they've already posted for those first three games which are atlanta lag Vegas, Texas, and Seattle, Toronto. We, we might spend a little more time on those just because, yeah, we've got some examples that we can give in here. The later games, uh, maybe take some of what we're talking about in the earlier games and try to apply it. But yeah, we don't know what DraftKings will price the players for Saturday and Sunday yet. We don't know what prize picks will think the over-unders on kills should be. So yeah, just try to, uh, we'll, we'll spend a little more time on the first three games since that's what's happening tomorrow. Hell yeah. Atlanta phase, Los Angeles Gorillas. Seems a little lopsided, no? Yes. <laughs> this is a game between a team locked in for champs and a team that's probably locked out of champs, uh, as much as it pains me to say as a Gorillas fan. Um, I think, yeah, this game is a bit lopsided. I've heard I've heard some takes that maybe Atlanta is going to uh, – all right, they're going to pick maps that they might not play otherwise because they need to be tuning up for champs. I mean, not that I think it's bad or good. I think it's hard to say that we should like expect anything like that. But I mean, yeah, if I were Atlanta, that's what I would be doing because I am locked into champs. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters a little what place you get going into champs, but it matters much more that you're the best team that you can be going into champs. So to me, maybe that's worth it. I don't. I wouldn't put any stock into that coming into this game. I think that Atlanta's, I think the, the right thing or the 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 best bet that you have is that Atlanta's probably going to cruise through this game fairly easily. Um, one thing I wanted to note and like just to get into the lesson here right away is that like on DraftKings, uh, the way that they price the players uh, is very, I wouldn't say lazy, but just like very efficient. They just take however many points the players have scored on average over their last whatever amount of games, and then they have some then they just convert that into salary. So if a player's scored more points on average per game, they cost more on average in salary. So this opens up the chance for us to be a little smarter about which players we pick on DraftKings because a player in the next game, so like let's say a BZ, uh, his average fantasy points over his last 20 games is the average of him playing pretty much all the teams in the league. On a, He's playing a league average team on average. And so whatever amount of points he gets per game, that's reflecting the average. Well, in this next game, he's playing against LEG. That's not a league average team. And so we might be able to get a little more value out of playing a player on phase because of the fact that their stats don't really reflect. They don't get to play LEG every game. They get to play, they have to play harder teams. I and mean, they arguably have to play more better teams because of the fact that they might go deeper in tournaments. So so I had, I had written down here that uh, Atlanta in control in their last 20 games is 10 and 10. Um, so they've won 50% of them. So if we look at Abizi's control stats, they'll reflect a team, a player that's gone 10 and 10 in control, but they are not 50% to win against LAG. Bavada has them at 80% to win the control against LAG. I've got them a little lower than that, but like it, it remains to be seen that like Abizi is going, his stats are going to be a bit misleading about how much control value he might have. I, I think the same applies to search and hardpoint. I think control is the most obvious example because phase hasn't been, yeah, they're 10 and 10 in their last 20 controls, but they are much stronger than LAG is. So that's one little thing we can do. I think phase is probably the biggest example of this, um, but I do think that this also applies to the Optic Texas versus Legion game, which we'll talk about next. But I think it, the, the same sort of thing applies. When you're a team that's playing a below average team, you're probably going to be a bit mispriced on DraftKings. Yeah, with a with a situation like that, right? So say phase and, well, obviously we're talking about phase LAG, it seems like it should be an easy win for FaZe. Do you take into consideration, you know, a quick 3-0 when it comes to actually picking people within these apps? Like, I know, 
like me personally, if I heard it, like it's going to be a really easy 3-0. I think of a control being super close, which means there's not really too many engagements because every engagement phase wins like they're winning them easily. So would this be, you know, in your opinion, a good opportunity to like look on the lower side of kills for both of these teams? Yeah, you bring up a good point, which is I, I think there are like three big things when thinking of so like, yeah, game length or like the yeah, the length of time that we can get kills is really important for prize pick specifically. So on DraftKings, I'll make a little note about DraftKings in this first, because I think it's it's a little easier to explain. But like because of the fact that if you win the game faster, you tend to get more kills relative to deaths. Like if you look at the K the highest KDs are the KDs of players that won a game that only took six minutes or something like that. You don't you don't see a game go 249, 250 and a guy going 65 and 40 or whatever. It's usually 40 and 40 or something. So in the short games, on DraftKings, because you get 2x the points for a kill relative to a death, even if the games are short, you get compensated extremely fairly for like the shorter games. But that is not the case on prize picks. On prize picks, we're just talking raw kills. So will they get 25 kills? Well, yeah, if the game lasts five minutes, it's going to be hard to get 25 kills. And so like I think the big, the big three things that affect how long the game is going to go is, yeah, how likely a team is to win. Um, what the map is, is the other big one. And then just like uh, the the lopsidedness of the maps themselves. So like in search or whatever, if you have a map that's 90% defense favored or something like that, that can help a team that's not as strong make the map go one extra round. And when we're talking in search, we, we are talking on the on the, like the order of just one extra round in the game could make a big difference to get, yeah, we're, most of the over-unders in search are like six, seven, eight kills. So like one extra round, and you just need one more kill that can make a big difference so like i think those are the big three i found that the third of those is not very impactful typically but i do think that map plays a huge i mean a map can add one or two or even three additional kills uh, in my projections in terms of like how many a player might get so yeah it's very important to be wary of how strong a team is and then what map i would say if i had to rank the three um the map is the most important for dictating how many kills the team gets the the skill differential between the teams is sort of middling. It's a little important. I, I haven't seen many cases where a team can be so favored in a map of hard point that it, or in a map of control or search, I should say, where they get more than a kill um, extra added on or taken away because the game is so short. But you're 100% right that those are the things you need to be thinking about on prize picks. Because, yeah, it, you don't get any bonus points if a BZ doesn't get 25 kills, but he goes. 20 and three like it just doesn't matter so you need uh yeah you need to be considering that you said maps is a, a a big thing too so say it's like you know hotel where it's more close quarters than your embassy of the world would that be a situation where you would look towards you know an smg who's going to be getting mixy inside of like playing the hill and i know that could play on both sides with you know pickums as well as you know building a lineup because like you said, you'll get points for, you know, hill time and all that stuff. But if you're getting in more engagements as an SMG, you're buzzing around, there's more of a chance to go higher on your kills. But when you say like maps, do you also take into consideration what role these guys are playing before you pick them? I wouldn't say that I explicitly am thinking about the role be because I think that the past performance of the players should be indicative of or like, yeah, should sort of bake in their role a bit. So what I think is probably most important from what you're saying there is that like, let's say, yeah, I so I guess actually let me let me back up to one really important thing on prize picks. You get one big advantage, which is that the lines will stay up even after we know what maps they're going to play in the series and that's a huge advantage that cannot be overlooked um i think in general and like you see this in many sports that like you people say you want to play prize picks as early as possible before they move the lines on these players and stuff like typically your your sports betters your professional sports betters are either staying up till 1 a.m to wait for prize picks to post lines for a bait a baseball slate or something to try to get the freshest like most naive numbers but that is not always the case in cod because in cod yeah 30 minutes before we suddenly know that the team's playing hard point on hydro which plays incredibly slowly that's a huge piece of information if you're betting that the night before you're betting without a really key piece of information that other people are gonna know um and so like i would say that first but then okay let's say we're, we're in your uh your hotel example here and we want to know we're, we're trying to decide if the smg role that the player plays is important it could 
potentially lead to more kills. Well, one, if they've played that map in the past, we should know how fast they play. We can look at that. But also, we should be able to look at a game that they played on Hydro and sort of adjust for that. Like, uh, SMG players that play on Hydro get X amount of kills less than their average. So we should be able to extrapolate from that. If we know that on, on Hotel, SMGs get a little bit more, we should be able to do basically do the math. That's what I'm doing, is like looking at the players on all the maps and then adjusting for their like their uh the map that they played so i'm looking at a pass game he he dropped 25 on a hydro then i would say just from that one map we'll, we'll make it simple if he dropped 25 on a hydro i'm thinking he's going to drop 28 on a on a hotel hard point and like so suddenly by playing a hydro i've informed my like betting on a hotel game as well uh, it's interesting okay so with, uh, you know, that's obviously great information for this matchup. So one thing I feel like could be beneficial for us before we move on to, you know, the next matchup, you know, one last piece of, you know, knowledge for the people going in there, uh, like one thing to look for that could help them, you know, inform the player they're actually going to move forward with. One thing to look out for, if you would. Um, I think, like, yeah, I do think because, actually, yeah, that we'll turn this into a little bit of a, a mini lesson here too, that, which is that like uh, we, we need to think about the points per dollar that the players on DraftKings are going to be able to get us. Um, points per dollar is a big thing. Like I mentioned before, DraftKings is pricing their players. It seems mostly on just their average performance in the past and then multiplying it by some amount. I, I was saying uh, earlier that I, I suspect it's, or it ends up being about 11 points per thousand dollars. So a player that's 10, thousand dollars should be on average getting 110 points um and so like in positions we i mentioned before like phase guys their average performance relative to how they might do against lag is not going to be is going to be uh pessimistic of their performance it's so like okay i want to get uh, maybe get some phase guys in my DraftKings lineup well i look at the prices on the the salary on those players Selium is the most expensive player on the slate at 10,200 but i see a bz at 9,400 um and who's averaging a slightly more 102.4 versus 102.07 for Selium. um so like both those players are averaging 102 points yet Selium is a thousand additional dollars and so now i'm looking at that and saying for a points per dollar basis, if both of them on average score that many, like I like a BZ a lot. I think a BZ is great for that. Like, yeah, that that's that can be the beginnings of you building out a lineup is start by saying, okay, I know phases might be a little underpriced here. So who on phase do I like? Well, yeah, it's sort of just it, it's helpful that they lit that a BZ literally has more points per game than Celium, but like you can you could say even if you had a little bit less for a thousand less dollars, you should be willing to get almost eleven less points. Um, and so yeah, that's. I think, yeah, like looking at this game, I, I like Abizi a lot just from that standpoint. It's like it, without even having to run the numbers on what I think he's exactly going to do, I, I know one, just from the fact that they're playing lag, he's going to be a bit underpriced. And two, compared to Selium, he's a bit underpriced. I don't even need to know his projection to know that he's probably going to be a pretty good play. I like that. Boom. That's what I was looking for right there. Dr. Doug. Um, all right. Cool. Move on to the next one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, next one, we have Las Vegas Legion. Versus Optic Texas. Yes, I think this is a game. Uh, I mean, I've been very vocal on social media about the fact that, like, I've I was skeptical of Vegas's abilities going into the major. Obviously, I gave myself a big pat on the back when they lost or whatever. Although it was disappointing. I I, I love a good Cinderella story as much as the next guy for sure. But like, I think I mean Vegas playing arguably the four worst teams out of their in their five games although they did also beat toronto they played four really bad teams leading up to the major they just hadn't proven anything to me to me the, i mean and also like when i when i do my projections it's based a lot on strength of schedule and so like my projections were also fairly low on them because they just hadn't done anything it wasn't that they were bad because they'd won their games but they just hadn't really proven anything and then i think they went to the major and sort of realized they might not be as good as some people were thinking. So do I, I I think that this is another juicy matchup where Texas is probably in the same spot that FaZe is in, where they've been playing pretty well as of late. They obviously, because they went deeper in the tournament, they had to play a lot of tough opponents. Their average stats might look a little depressed compared to what they're going to be able to put up against Vegas. I think this, yeah, I honestly think that the Texas spot is a lot like the FaZe spot and that like, yeah, they're playing a team. I'd say the only the only big difference here, if you want to be uh, on Narrative Street, is that 
Vegas obviously like they need this really bad. Optic is already qualified, um, but Vegas need this really bad. They have a really tough stage ahead of them. Each any of these games that they could, if they could take this game off Optic, that would be enormous for them to and their chances to make champs. So obviously they're going to be coming out 100%. I'm not really a guy who buys into the oh they're going to come out at 110%. Why weren't they giving it before? So uh, I uh, I don't put a lot into that, but I do think that like. It, that's maybe the only slight difference here. If I'm if I'm Atlanta, I'm I'm just beaten down on a team with no chance. But with Texas, like yeah, they've got something to play for. Um, I do think, like you look at the DraftKings prices for some of the for Vegas. Um, I see Clayster is the second lowest priced player on the slate. TJ Haley is the fifth fifth or yeah fifth most least priced player on the slate. I don't hate that. I think that again, we talk about points per dollar. Like they are extremely low priced for uh, how many points per dollar they can put up. If you're putting a player like that in your lineup, you're going to be able to get more, more Celium, more Abizi, some Scrap, Dashy players that are really expensive. Dashy is really expensive, ten thousand. Um, so yeah, I think it's uh. So like yeah, if we use this eleven points per thousand dollar like benchmark that I've been using uh, for Clayster, he would need to score sixty eight points. I think. Um, he's done that in all but like a, a handful of games in his last 20 or something. I had, I thought I had it written down, but I don't, but yeah, like, uh, like that's a great example. It's like, if I assume 11 points per thousand dollars, I look at Clayster, I say, okay, all he needs is 68 points to make value. That's not a lot of points. And you start to scroll back through some of these players, like recent games, you start to notice there are some players back here that are easily hitting these numbers most of the time. And all that says is, okay, well now you're going to have more room for a guy with a huge upside. I don't expect Clayster to ever drop 140 or something, but it sure helps me afford a guy like Pred who might get 140. So um, I think that's one thing to look at here. With yeah. Vegas. And how would, so like I'm looking at it now as well. So you have six, $6,800 for TJ. A uh, lot of, lot of love for TJ. I uh, just want to throw that out there. Uh, projected at 76.4. And then Clayster is cheaper, but is projected more like points why like shouldn't that isn't that a little backwards yeah like if they were literally just taking the average points per game and multiplying it by their their factor they should i yeah i mean who knows how DraftKings actually makes the pricing maybe more recent performance would suggest that those players or like recent games maybe they're waiting the more recent games more i will say there's a lot it, there seems to be some nonsensical pricing on DraftKings. I wouldn't expect, and I, this goes all the way back to the first thing that I said, which is like, who are you making the money from? You're not, DraftKings isn't paying you to play DraftKings. You're paying DraftKings to play DraftKings. DraftKings could put up, I mean, they can't do this because it would make the game incredibly lame and boring. They could make everyone a dollar on the slate and they still make 10 to 15% of the entry fees on the way in. So like, if you start to like get into the headers like, oh, DraftKings knows more. They, they, yeah, they, they've got some intel that Clay is like not as strong of a player or whatever. That's not what it is. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't matter. Like, it, yeah, I, that's why I tend to think that they go for the laziest approaches, which maybe this makes it seem a little confusing. You're like, well, yeah, if it was the laziest approach, Clay should be more than TJ. But I don't know. I, you don't. You would stay up all night if you lost sleep over DraftKings pricing uh, discrepancies. Like, yeah, that what was it last week? They had a team that was like a huge underdog, is like the second most expensive team on the slate or something like that. Like, it's just it's nonsense sometimes. So yeah, I wouldn't. But yeah, I mean, hey, that that's edge for us. If other people are just looking at this, maybe they don't. They're not thinking about that. Yeah. Um, so one thing I noticed when I pulled up the app too, and you might have said this at the beginning, but I found it interesting. Apparently, you get points for people that plant the bomb. Yes, yeah, you get points for plants. Um, I've not ever, I have never delved into the predictability of bomb planting. Mm. I mean, if there are players like I don't know, I mean, the person who jumps out because I know they've tweeted, the league has tweeted about Joe Deceives being a big bomb planner in Search and Destroy. Um, one, you're not getting a ton of points from the bomb plants, but two, like, let's say Joe DeCives was repeatedly the best bomb planter in the league. That would show up in his points per game, the same as everything else. I do think, yeah, uh, I think we'll save the tangent on predictability of individual stats within the DraftKings point system for another day. But I do think that, like, yeah, if you're just going on points per game average over time you're not considering the fact that yeah things like bomb plants are probably less predictable or more variable over time than things like kills or kills per minute or something like that and so like you might get a little lost in the weeds if you start saying 
well, this guy averages two plants per game because maybe some games he has none, another he has 10 or whatever, where kills is not like that. So we can talk about that another time, but I do think that that is an important point here is if you're just looking at overall points per game, you're you're mixing up or like you're you're putting a bunch of stuff together that maybe isn't all the same yeah <clears throat> that makes sense uh so i'm looking on it too last thing i'll say on this one and then you can give your last you know nugget and we'll move on i like the price of ghosty for 7200 i i do i'm not get, i'm not saying and for anyone to pick this i just think it's very low like dashy 10,000 and ghosty 7200 like to me like that just looks good and i'm no pro with this just looks good yeah I would say, like, I mean, one thing about Dashy, or not about Dashy, about Ghosty in general, is that, like, we have seen him have some pop-off games. Like, one thing you're always trying to balance, like, I talk about making value. It's like, this player needs to score this many points before I'd say, like, he was worth the value, like, the worth the slot on my roster. The other thing we need to consider, especially in a tournament format, which is, like, anytime you have, like, yeah, a big 20x payout to first place or whatever, um, is that, like, you're not you don't want to just get so like you get to pay fifty thousand dollars you don't just want 11 points per thousand dollars over your whole fifty thousand you need some upside too you need some guy popping off we think about the players that are the most expensive typically having the most pop-off potential and like but that is com almost completely separate of like what we would call like floor expectation which is like yeah ghosty is like he's got a decently high floor because even if he doesn't do well if optic 3 O's, he gets a bunch of bonus points for his team 3 owing and that's great but ghosty's got some upside too like you're not seeing a guy like clay or lamar accuracy is a good example like he's not dropping many 140 point games and but you're not paying very much for him either so it might be worthwhile ghosty you're not paying that much for and he might pop off so yeah. I mean, yeah, it's another thing to think about for sure. I, I do think those things are almost two sides of the same coin, which is like how much floor and how much ceiling do you have here? Like, yeah, typically the more expensive they are, the higher the floor and the ceiling. But there are guys that sort of defy that a bit, which is, yeah, guys with huge pop off that typically pretty quiet. But yeah, if you're trying to win, if you're trying to beat 500 players in a contest, you need a guy to be in his 99th percentile outcome sometimes. Like you're not going to win just by all your guys doing exactly what you thought they were going to do. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> any uh any final things to look for in this matchup before we move on to the next uh i had put here uh just as like an illustrative example so shotzi under seven kills in search um for prize picks i'm not sure if that line is still there i, I haven't been checked in the last hour or two but like th let's just like go through this example a little bit so one thing with uh, an even number like this so over under seven he can get exactly seven so when the uh let's say you make a two person bat and shotzi under seven is one of your bets if it comes up seven exactly then you just put it pushes the whole you get your money back but nothing else um so you get a little bit uh well you get one whole number that you basically can't hit or the whole bet voids but you also get a little bit more safety which is that like if they get seven exactly you're not out any additional money um but i just want to point out like shotzi has had more than seven kills five times in his last 20 search and destroy games um and over under seven in this game that is, uh, it, I have the search and destroy as a bit of a toss up. I mean, Vegas has the second highest round win rate in search in the whole uh, on the year. They're a fairly strong, have been a fairly strong search team all year. So it's not as if this game is going to be short. Um, so I don't know. I I think the under here is interesting. But yeah, that's a, that's another like good example of like what I'm looking at. I I see that number. I look at his average kills, and then I go back and say, okay, how often is he really hitting over this? It's five out of twenty. That seems a bit low but yeah you also have to consider this buffer which is if he hits seven exactly you're you're sol so sol uh all right next matchup toronto ultra seattle surge i like this matchup yeah this is definitely the spiciest matchup that we get on the friday um i think this is an interesting like if we're going to start I, i'm and it is uh it's telling i would say it's not ironic but like the way that I've been talking about these games so far is sort of the order of operations that I've been doing to try to break these games down as well, which is like first start for like the most general, which is the teams themselves. Like Toronto is a favorite in this game. What do we, what do they have them at in this game? Uh, 60, yeah, 68% to win on Bavada approximately when you remove the big. So big favorites to Toronto here. But we think about Seattle, they're a team that's won. They've been doing, they were doing fairly well. They had a decent major. Um, they've been yeah they've been a fairly average team but they're in a bad matchup here so this is the opposite i'd say toronto is in about like 
them playing Seattle is about playing league average for them, like the average team that they get to play. So I don't, they don't have the phase in the Texas effect here where they're playing a really bad team. So like they're probably a little underpriced. I'd say Seattle's a bit the opposite though. Seattle doesn't always have to play teams like Toronto, but they are playing a team Toronto today. So I think that makes me a little weary of Seattle players in DraftKings. Um, I think Pred, Pred it seems a bit immune to this uh, a bit because he, he'll just go off even if the team is losing. He's liable to go 40 and 30 and lose by 100. So, like, I think he has a lot of fantasy value, but he's also priced extremely highly on DraftKings. What is he? Yeah, 9,200. Uh, 9,200 on DraftKings. I don't hate it. I think, like, yeah, he's a guy you talk about big upside. Also, if you're in, you're, you're trying to win a GPP, like, yeah, Seattle winning that matchup and Pred going for 150 kills or whatever is, uh, that is not completely out of the realm of possibility. I mean, yeah, we're still getting 31% on Seattle to win the whole, the win the whole game. And like, you got to believe that if that happens, Pred is going to be the reason why. So I don't hate Pred, but I do think Seattle's in that same spot where it's like, they're, they're a, a, a decent above average team probably, but they're playing an even farther above average team uh, in this game. And so like their stats are probably going to be a bit optimistic on them. I think, I think Toronto's probably priced about right, and they seem to be in about the right spot. I do think Kleenex is a little interesting. He seems a bit low. Uh, I mean, just he sort of pops out on the page when you look at the points per game, I believe. Um, Kleenex is interesting here to me. Uh, what is he? 7,800, but he's averaging 92.6 points per game overall. And that sticks out when you're scrolling down the list as like the, the biggest discrepancy. So I think that's interesting. But I think Toronto, yeah, they're playing like... On the on the spectrum of all Toronto's games, a game against Seattle Surge is right in the middle in terms of like how challenging of a game it's going to be for them because they are an above average team. So, uh, yeah, I'm not super excited about that. Yeah. So <clears throat> with uh, Toronto is good for champs. Seattle is Seattle good for champs? Seattle is not guaranteed champs, but I I mean I have them very likely to make yeah. champs. Um, I don't think this is a must win game for them to cement champs. I would say, I mean, like if they do win this game, I'd say that's probably good enough, but, uh, I guess I, some people have brought up to me that Toronto's not necessarily a lock for champs. I said, I ran 10,000 simulations and they made it in all of them, which means even cause like with that many, you're getting many of the really unlikely outcomes in the simulations and they still made it in all of them. Apparently there's some tiebreakers that are possible for them to lose. Uh, to not make it still. I have them, for all intents and purposes, 100%. So theoretically, they haven't qualified either. So both of these teams are in the rare spot where both teams have something to play for, I suppose. But if I'm Toronto, I'm not losing any sleep, worrying that I'm not going to make champs. I've got them at, yeah, 99, 999, or whatever. So Yeah, um, maybe I'm the yes, person Seattle, that's like, I, 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 like you said at the beginning, I don't really look too much into, you know, like, how much they needed or like they're going to come out 110 percent i am complete opposite i'm like oh they got something to prove like you know they're going to be in their bag for this game so maybe that's me i have to break out of that but i always believe like you know you really need yeah. this game like this person's going to go nuts i do think it can be dangerous to like yeah stick yourself into too big of a narrative sometimes especially just in sports betting in general i mean it is certainly fun and it's it's just so easy to backfit like after the game happens, it'll be very easy to say, well, Seattle, they won. So, like, yeah, they, they realized that they weren't guaranteed for champs, so they came out super strong. But I don't know. Coming from a team background, I I mean, obviously, I was on LEG, so, like, we weren't always playing in, like, the most high-gravity uh, situations or whatever. But I never once believed that the players were not giving 100% every time. Like, yeah. there's just – they have too much to play for in their own right in every game. Like, with the shortness of salary – or the shortness of contracts and stuff like that, like, no player is just taking a game off. So, like, I yeah. And, I yeah, I'm not a believer in the 110%, and I believe everybody's going 100%. So, I don't know. It just brings me to this logical conclusion. It's like everybody's everybody's going hard. But, yeah, it's I do believe in tilt, though. Uh, if – the opposite can be true, which is like you get down in a series and the series is really important for you. I see this with Vegas. Like, I do believe in that. And maybe I'm just superstitious, but like, I believe, yeah, if I'm Vegas and like second game is a must win game, I think for them, they go down 0-2 in that series. I'd be slamming map three them to lose because like, I, would, I know how I would feel in that scenario. I'd be like, great. Yeah. My champs, my champs dreams are just dissipating in front of my eyes. So. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right, so yeah, that that's a good match. Uh, do you have any the, any little uh, tidbits before we, you know, move on? What are you looking for? You know, when you're a lineup, what are you looking for player wise? Of course, you know we're not telling you, you know, who to pick, but you know anything jump off the page to you other than Kleenex. 
Yeah, I think I think accuracy is really. I was sort of surprised by this because I do think like accuracy, obviously, I think if you were if you even if you didn't play daily fantasy draft kings, you would suspect that accuracy is a low scoring player. Um, I do think like part of it is hill time, but also he's just a fairly r consistent player. So he's at six thousand. So I, I put a target for him. If he can get 70 points, that's that's value for me at six thousand dollars. That that puts a lot of freedom in my lineup to play whoever I want. He has not gotten 70 points three times this year since 2023 started. He's only not gotten 70 points three times. So, I mean, like, that's major consistency for a player who, yeah, doesn't always light up the scoreboard. I think that's very interesting. It just gives you a lot of freedom. So they'd definitely be a guy I'd be wanting to mix into some lineups just because, yeah, at 6,000, it's just you really don't have to do much, like, even if you lose, you, it, he'd probably be better off getting 3 0 because he's going to get so many points from the bonuses that, like, it, it'd be worth playing. Because, yeah, now you're going to be able to get a BZ and Dashy in your lineup or something like that. So I, I do like accuracy a lot. I do think, uh, to point out one prize picks play that I think is interesting here as well, which is that we look at Mac under 6.5 in search. Um, he has gone under 6.5 in 15 out of his last 20 games. So the same as Shotzi. Uh, only five misses out of their last 20 games there. Um, and they have a below average chance to win the search this time around. I think, yeah, that one definitely jumped out to me as like probably the most mispriced seeming line here. Um, I will say one thing, which is that like uh, the lower the kill totals, like when we're talking about search, we, we think of like a player's outcomes in kills to be like this normally distributed kind of just like they, they could get a little more, they could get a little less. In search, you're getting so close to zero, they're n max never dropping negative two kills. And so like, you do have to be cautious here. Like there is a, I, I, I come from a, like a, a probability distribution theory statistics background. I think about that sort of stuff. You don't need to think about it like that, but just know that like, because you can't have this normal distribution anymore when you get towards zero, he's got to get something. And so like it tends to, if you think about it, just everything normally distributed, when you think about search and destroy kill totals, you might start to think the under more often than is necessary. Like it, he has to eventually get a kill. Like he, yeah, he can't get negative kills in a round. And so eventually he will get kills. And so like, yeah, do be wary of that. That is a uh, one, you, something you don't have to worry about in hard point. Cause you're never, they're also never dropping one or two or three kills. Like they're always going to get some. So. I mean, I think they could, I played on a land not too long ago. I dropped three against the top challenger team. So it's definitely possible, but. Um, wow. I, you know, I, I was very proud of those three. I'll tell you that. Hey, I took you over two, over two kills in that game, and I You're was welcome. pretty happy. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, all right, next we have uh, Minnesota in London. Uh, Minnesota, you know, is one of those bubble teams. Uh, and I'm, hey, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, 110% doesn't exist. But I'm just saying, you know, they're one of the bubble teams. Yeah, I think this game is interesting. Obviously, it's a home series game. So um, I think there'll be some rhetoric around the fact that they'll be better because they're playing at home. I mean, I think they'll be better because London's not a good team. Um, not because I think the home field advantage makes that much of a difference. I do, for the record, I will say, um, I've seen some some really hot takes, in my opinion, about home field advantage and stuff. I do think it makes a difference. in, And I'll go as far as to say, I'll go on the record and say that I think that when you're playing in front of a home crowd, like like Optic got the major, or even at, at a time where you're playing and there's a lot of crowd that's rooting for you, that does make a difference. Like people who thinks it doesn't, just because like, yeah, uh, I've seen it over generalized. It's like, oh, they're getting scared because the crowd is rooting for the other team. That's not how it works. Like, but that's not how it works in professional sports either. Steph Curry's not getting nervous because the the player, like the team is, or like the crowd is chanting for the other team. It just happens to improve the home team's chances. But I, I don't think it makes a difference here. It, it, more than half a percent or something. So I think Minnesota probably does a good job here. Um, I think this is a situation where, yeah, Minnesota gets a below average opponent. Minnesota is probably in a pretty good spot. Um, I've got them over 60% to win the respawns. I think that that uh, respawns, we didn't really touch on this, but respawns disproportionately affect your scoring in DraftKings. Because you get points for kills, the respawns are going to be where most of your kills are. So another nice little edge you can get is look for players that aren't as good in search compared to hard point and control because they're going to be getting more of their kills from those modes. So if you see a team in a bad search matchup, you might not need to steer as far away from it because it, yeah. It, it's the difference between them getting six and eight kills where in hard point if you get a good hard point matchup you can get 10 extra kills or something that's 
20 points. So um, I do, I noted that about Minnesota is that their respawn game looks strong relative to London's, regardless of how the series ends up coming out. If London can steal some searches, make the game interesting. I like Minnesota in the respawns. So that's something that jumped out to me right there that you said, which is good knowledge for, you know, someone who's newer to this. If it's someone that, you know, does not have much potential when it comes to respawn, it's probably someone you should be wary about picking, correct? When it comes yeah. to like daily, when it comes to like DraftKings, as opposed to you know betting an under on prize picks. Yeah, I think in general, I'd say in general that is true. I mean, obviously, if it's just the kills aspect of it, um, it should reflect in their price over time. Uh, but yeah, I think that you can be a little faster than DraftKings is to adjust their prices if you start to realize players that are just are getting more of their kills from search. Like, let's say you see a guy, this is a good example, a guy gets like a 16 kill search game or something like that. DraftKings increases his price because he scored more points per game now. Very unlikely he's going to get 16 more kills in the search. And like, that's a that's still a lot of kills. And so, yeah, I would, I would expect to get, like I might fade a guy like that. Or yeah, a guy gets one kill in the search and his points per game goes down. Well, it doesn't matter. Even if he's pretty bad, his mean outcome is still five or six kills probably he's not going to get one again so like yeah i would and then i'd be high on that guy maybe if he can drop if he drops 130 bomb in the hard point i don't care if he drops three in the search like i'm still getting all my points so um yeah i like i like players like that and i yeah you're right try to avoid the players on the opposite end of that where it's like man yeah this guy's averaging 12 in search but also 12 in control like that's yeah. not that's not the spot you want to be in yeah and I, I one more one more thing i asked it the complete opposite side but i want to just kind of bring a full circle there were some games at the beginning you know atlanta leg that have that 3-0 potential so you're looking at it from a lens that this is going to be over fast what about like a toronto and seattle that could go the distance you know it could go a game five like how do you take into consideration like a situation like that where it could come to a game five yeah from a DraftKings perspective so I've, I've done a little bit of like looking into this um i would say so like basically the question that you're asking although you might not realize is like is basically how well compensated are we for games not played um in the DraftKings scoring system like am i better off having my guy get the chance to play five games and get kills or am i better off just taking the free 20 points for a three or, so you get 20 points for not playing the hard point plus another five for not playing the search. So my free 25 points for the game being a 3-0, am I going to get more than 25 points or less is basically the question we're asking. From what I've seen, you are more than well compensated for 3 0 So I, not that I stray away from potential game fives, but I'm not worried about trying to find close matchups. And I think that you start to lose the value even more here because if the team does go game five and they don't win, like you are in a worse spot. Like your players have played more games, but only won two out of the five of them. Like you're in a worse spot than you might be otherwise if they just like, if you pick a team more likely to 3 0. So, yeah, I will say this brings up a bigger point that we don't need to go deep into, but like when you're using DraftKings or prize picks, you're not, we're not talking about betting the games like going on bet 365 or something and just betting the money line on a team to win or whatever you should be using that information to try to inform your picks so like i can go on bovado or bet 365 and see what their odds are on a 3-0 victory um i can look at like the spread on the game and get the uh, approximate if i try to estimate the vig that they're taking approximate chances of 3-0 i can use that information to help me build DraftKings lineups like yeah i'm i'm estimating myself personally the chances of 3-0s for all the games and i use that as part of the my pick like I'll play more phase guys because I see that the the implied probability of phase 3 owing is high, like, period. Like, then, so, like, I think if you're not using Vegas to try to, or I guess I'll say the bookmakers because saying Vegas is confusing. In this <laughs> if you're not using the bookmakers to help inform your decision, and the other one's like, you're just missing a big resource. Like, they, they take a lot of money in. Like, yeah, maybe prize picks or DraftKings alone doesn't have a huge incentive to be super accurate, but I mean, these big books do, at least to some degree. And so, yeah, why not use that information to try to help you? Um, yeah, so like three O's is a big one. Look at the books, see what they think the three O. I, I mentioned how like, yeah, search performance is not as important as respawn. Look at the map two win odds for these teams. Uh, is Yeah, maybe, or well, I guess maybe look at the map one win odds to see if there may be more favored in respawns. Like use that information, it, it can only help. Yep. Uh, any final things on Rock or Ravens? Nope. I think, yeah. No, I think we're good. Good. Moving on. Vegas is back, not the bookmakers. 
the Legion. Uh, <laughs> Vegas Legion versus the New York Subliners. Yeah, I think this is a game, um, especially on DraftKings, and to go back to the fact that, like, on DraftKings, you're playing against other players, and, like, you want, uh, I think people in general are still just high on Vegas. People have got that Vegas hype. People think that Vegas is still a strong team. They think they underperformed at the major, where I would argue they performed to their capabilities at the major, and they overperformed during the stage. Um, so I, I like New York here in all four, like in DraftKings format, for sure. I think New York is a strong play. I don't think that the bookmakers were fooled by their hometown brethren here. The bookmakers have New York as huge favorites in this game, and I think that's accurate. And so, yeah, if I'm going in, I'm thinking maybe I get a little bit of an edge here because, yeah, guys like TJ or Standy are going to be higher owned because people like Vegas in this spot, and they know that, yeah, maybe they're like you. They're thinking, I'm thinking Standy's given 130% in this game. I got to own him. Maybe you are wise. Even if he does go off, you're probably wiser to play against it because, yeah, you're pay you're getting paid out a lot more if he doesn't hit those big numbers and so yeah i i do think this is what we would call a trap game i think people playing vegas are going to get trapped um when vegas gets insta 3-0 they're going to be like damn and then if they if vegas does if vegas does win they're going to say you're an idiot but you just need to remember like <laughs> doug told me i wasn't an idiot this was <laughs> this was the right thing to do trust the process trust the process yeah but there's a get out of jail free card you just say the ping and you're yeah. all good, like, oh, yeah, it was just, you know, the ping, and boom. I mean, if this game was played on LAN, it would have been different. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Um, so, with, like, people listening now, we don't have, like, the, as Doug said at the beginning, there's no info out on these when it comes to these apps just yet because, you know, these are the, the later slate games, if you would. Um, but, you know, we're doing what we can for you. Uh, anything that jumps out to you in this matchup, Doug? I know that you said that, you know, you feel as if it's a trap game. Um, you know, people might be on the Vegas side, but you're thinking New York. Is there any other, you know, tidbits that jump out to you when it comes to this matchup? I would say the uh, the only other, like, interesting thing about this game is just how mismatched and controlled these two teams are. I mean, every I think everyone knows at this point that Vegas is a pretty weak control team, but New York is an extremely strong control team. Um, they've won 60% of their last 20 games, so... Uh, but I what Bovada has them at 85 percent. I've got them at 90 percent to win the control. Um, that's those are crazy numbers. Um, like, uh, yeah, now we're in the territory of talking about a potentially shorter control game. Even mm -hmm. uh, New York is so strong. Like um, it certainly depends on the map, though. Yeah, like I mentioned, maps that are really one sided can really like help teams get to the game to the round four, round fives, even if they're much weaker than the other team. Where the the more split maps, yeah, you might see them end in three more often. But I do think that's worth mentioning. Yeah, I, yeah, that eighty five percent is the highest win chance of any team in any mode over the whole weekend on Bovada. So like they, yeah, the New York in control game three, they seem to think, yeah, lock it up. So just use that information how you will. Like you can use it on DraftKings to say, okay, that those are free respawn points for my New York guys. But you can also say, yeah, from a prize picks perspective maybe looking at Vegas unders or New York unders even saying this game might be short. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like some Vegas unders. I don't know about New York unders without looking at it, but uh, I would imagine Vegas players will be like, they'll be really low because Vegas is always bad at control, but I would say, yeah, they're even worse than normal here playing against a really strong team. The unders might be strong. Good info, Doug. I like that. Use the info and, you know, uh, use it to your advantage. Uh, moving on. We have Minnesota Rocker versus the Boston Breach. Uh, definitely a lot at stake with this matchup. Uh, how are we feeling? Yeah, this is a huge game for both teams. Played on LAN, uh, home game for Minnesota again. I think this is the game that sort of puts to the test the, the question of whether the home field advantage really makes any bit of difference. Because, yeah, Vega said vegas again the bookmakers would have you believe that yeah boston is a strong favorite here i tend to agree um but yeah you might see some people some action especially on DraftKings, going the other way trying to get some some on land second game warm-up cheese like uh so yeah i i i, I do want to say though i i do want to say they are going to land but it is still an online game i think that's important yes. to know it's important to yes. know, you know, that they're not on the same network. Not that I know, but, uh, I mean, you know, it's an online on game. The same, 
they're not on the same network even when they play true. at esports arlington or whatever i remember that was the big thing last year i don't know if that's still true but i every year when we went to arlington yeah we were playing online against people five feet away from us yeah. or whatever but uh but yeah so um yeah so as you said we still have the ping card just because they're five feet away doesn't mean that we can't hold the ping card nope. uh so um yeah I'd say this is a game where it's uh, going to be if we're if we want to be smart, if we want to be informed, we don't have good past data suggest that the home series is really that big of an advantage. I mean, Minnesota played Florida and LAG uh, the first time. I'm not taking much away from those games in terms of and the home the home crowd it adds 10 percent or something. It, I'm not believing that yet. So as like a in it, a better who wants to be well informed, I'm saying I'm taking. This, these numbers at face value like even if this game had been played online from the comfort of their own homes i'm still liking these odds so yeah take that for what it's worth but i think yeah boston breach could be strong here because some people are going to believe especially when when minnesota inevitably 3-0s london in the first game because london isn't a strong team either and that could totally happen people are going to be rushing to bet or to play minnesota later on um They'll Especially with the ro- with the roster change for Boston bringing Vivid back into the rotation, like they don't know, you know what's going yeah, on with true. the new player. Yeah, you're weighing uncertainty on one hand with certainty on the other hand, which is we've already seen Minnesota play a game this weekend and they won potentially. Um, so yeah, it, that yeah, you're right. We're actually heading for this like perfect storm of like super yeah super narrative. It's like team with a win faces team with a uh, new player. Like yeah boston five percent to win or whatever so yeah no i i think that's that's probably all that needs to be said there but yeah i think i think i mean i, I like boston i think the books odds on this are are extremely fair um so just don't get blindsided use the book use the book's information to help you bet don't don't look at the book and say how could how do i disagree with the book and then bet like that that's you're not going to be a good way to win money nope uh all right toronto ultra la thieves another good matchup Yes, I had mentioned it before the show, but like some of these later games. So what is it? So Toronto, L.A., and then New York Subliners, Thieves, um, specifically those two games are they're just um, and then phase against optic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Three of these games out of the last four are just like extremely close games. I mean, banger games for sure. No doubt about it. But as we talked about, like because you're more than well compensated for blowouts, like it makes me less interested in these games where there are closer, like, yeah, when it's a closer matchup, because yeah, I don't want to be stuck in the game five, holding the player on the losing team. Like that is just going to suck. And I don't want to play a team that is, that is maybe a little cheaper on DraftKings, but yeah, could potentially lose in game five. Um, So yeah, I, so like this is the first of them but well i'll just i'm saying it now so that when we get to those games and i say the same thing like yeah it's uh i think it's a it's a tricky game how do you if you have really strong conviction one way or the other that toronto or hunter t is stronger like maybe you play off of that but i mean i i tend to agree with the book here that i've got i've got let a bit stronger than toronto but only a bit um i think they they match up well against them in all three modes i don't see a mode in which they're particularly uh favored so yeah i don't know i don't get excited i think this is going to be a situation where when the DraftKings lines come out you're going to want to play directly to those like whatever their average has been look at that and then is it are you getting good value at that i'm not i'm not going to be projecting any of these guys to explode or yeah so it's it's just tough um yeah you can have situations where some of these guys that have been playing really well yeah they're playing against another really good team they don't do as well so these are games I, I would try to stay away from in general, unless you've got some strong conviction one way or the other that it is favorable for a certain player. I, yeah, I'm, I'm pessimistic. Are, are you pessimistic kind of on the remainder, you know, of the weekend, just due to how close, you know, the matchups actually are? Uh, I think, I think Florida LAG is interesting, especially yeah. because Florida LAG um, is, so Florida LEG will be on Sunday. Um, so Florida LEG will be the first game on Sunday. I think it's interesting because, so we've got Vegas having Florida as big, fav- not big favorites, 60% favorites um, to win against LEG. And so, and the other two maps here are Optic against FaZe and New York against 100T, which are, I would say, fairly even matchups. Um, let's see, Vegas, Vegas has 100T as decent favorites over in New York, although I would, 
my models would tend to disagree. I would say it's a bit closer than what they have it at. So I do think that that game is interesting because of the fact that it's the only, it could be potentially the only game on that DraftKings slate that has like some big upside, some 3-0 potential. I don't see Optic against Texas or New York against LAT being a 3-0. And so like, yeah, I might, I might be wanting to bet, especially if I see how Gorillas play in their first game. I might be willing to take some Florida potential 3-0 action here at pretty low prices, I would imagine. I, I can't imagine that DraftKings jacks up the price of the Florida guys uh, for that match, even with probably a decent uh, Vegas line. I, that's just my hunch because everyone in that game is going to be so low price or like so low points per game. Um, I'm very curious to see what they'll do with that game. But that game, that's a game you should watch out for. Because, yeah, if you wake up on Sunday or I guess Saturday night, you see the lines and yeah, you've got Florida guys really low, even if they are only 60% to win, like you, you have a big chance for them to explode. Somebody's got to, somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to win every game. So yeah, I, I do think that game interests me a bit more than the other two, just because it is so different than the other two. But. I love that. Um, all right. So that's, you know, that's a slate. That's uh that's all. That, that's a lot of information. Dr. Doug. It's like, you know what you're talking about, brother. It is, yeah. It's uh, it, it's it's tough, yeah. Looking at all ten games all at once, because I do like, I yeah, I'll, I'll make one last advocate advocate that uh, to advocate for the fact that on Prize Picks, yeah, we want to know these maps before we make the most informed decisions that we can make. So it's a little tough from a Prize Picks perspective. Um, but yeah, I I hope that there's been some stuff in here that is more generally applicable things that you can think about in all the games. I do think like that what we touched on with like the length of the games and the points per dollar value of players on DraftKings, those things are generally applicable across most games. We try to apply that same lens to every game. We're going to be better off in the long run. Um, I think trying to come at every game as if it's brand new is yeah it's just a it's a tough way to either get burnt out confused misguided or getting going the wrong direction so yeah i like i like this idea let's have this framework and let's try to apply it to every game 100 percent. and for the people listening to you know this is the pilot episode if you would of you know this new product that we uh we're working on you know that is spearheaded by doug and you know his expertise but you know the maybe the format changes. Maybe we make it easily more easy, more easily digestible for you guys. So you know, for the people that somehow and you know uh, have a way to you know give us feedback or something, we are more than open to it because uh, I know it's a lot of information. But you know, hopefully as it goes on, you know we're able to guide this better and you know just make it more digestible for you guys. But uh, you know we'll always be improving it, but I definitely, I definitely as a person that is not too knowledgeable on this, got a lot of you know golden nuggets from you throughout this, uh, and I hope everyone listening is too. And it's just the start of you know a lot more, you know, uh, expertise and insights to come. So uh, yeah, I had a, I had a good time. Doug, did you have a good time? Yes, I had a good time as well. Yeah, I, I totally, I, yeah, just want to reiterate that. Feel free to reach out to me on Twitter. Um, yeah, I mean, like, if we're super open to whatever uh, whatever people think. Yeah, if you say, I hate, hey, I don't want to hear about Sunday games on Thursday. I'd rather hear, yeah, more about just the general strategy. We can do that. If you say, hey, I don't care about that. I just want to know the games. I want to know what to be thinking about. We can do that. Feel free to reach out to me. I mean, I'm, I'm watching the games all weekend too. So if you got specific questions about these games or, yeah, the lines come out and, uh, DraftKings misprices a player or whatever. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I, I, I can talk about that separate of the podcast. So if the podcast is better for just talking about, yeah, general things that we can do to be better, or, or maybe even like a retrospective, we can talk. Maybe you and I can talk a little bit about the last weekend and how what we did and what worked and what didn't work. It, we got a million things we could do. So, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'll probably post about it some too. Just, yeah, try to get more feedback. But yeah, we're super open. 100%. Uh, well, that'll do it. Uh, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend watching some banger Call of Duty. Uh, I am Crispy. This is Dr. Doug Levy over here, the absolute fucking whiz. Um, and this is Quick Fix Fantasy. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week.